الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Session 2 is basically about the most important part of our aqeedah. If I was to say that I only have, if someone was to say to me, Muhammad Tim, you have to teach aqeedah to some brothers. And you only have 45 minutes to teach it. Then this session is what I would teach. This session is the stuff that you absolutely need to know without a shadow of a doubt. And inshallah, maybe if we have uh, a white, do we have a whiteboard pen? Is this a whiteboard pen? Yeah, we're going to maybe scribble some things on the board as well, if that's not too, uh, inshallah, will that work for you guys as well? Good. Okay. So this is the most important part of our aqidah. And this is the essence of our religion. This is everything, all of Islam. If a non-Muslim asked you, what is Islam? All of Islam is in this. What we're going to cover in this session too. Every single thing that is important in Islam is in this. When you enter Islam, how does a person become Muslim? So they take shahada. What shahada do they take? So they say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So they bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is the messenger of Allah. Fantastic. This statement that we have لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله is basically deals with two major major areas of aqeedah. In fact, they are really, the whole of Islam comes back to these two areas of Aqeedah. All of your deeds being accepted comes back to these two areas of Aqeedah. Your whole religion from the beginning to the end comes back to these two areas of Aqeedah that are specified or that are, are, are sort of embodied by La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Now the first part we're going to talk about is Tawheed. Once again, we're going to just take a moment to look at Arabic for a moment. Tawheed is the verbal noun, and that's a bit of a technical English word. Some people call it a gerund, but it's sort of, if I say running, swimming, uh, fighting, these are all verbal nouns, yeah? So it's a word like that. It's a word that, that, that's sort of a word that is, it comes from the doing word, the verb, and it means sort of, it sort of is a noun that, that summarizes the meaning of the verb. In any case, it's a verbal noun which comes from the Arabic verb wahada yuwahidu. And wahada means to unify something or to make something one or to declare something to be one. So when Saudi Arabia used to be different parts, there used to be like a Hijaz used to be a, a part with a different ruler and Najd in, in uh, uh, like the Riyadh area, Riyadh and Qasim used to be a different part with a different ruler and the south, you know, towards Yemen and so on. When all those places in Saudi Arabia came together, what do you think they called that? Tawheed. They called it, no, Wahada. Yeah, they said Wahada, Wahada al-Bilad, yani, or Wahda, you know, they called it Tawheed al-Bilad. So it, everything became one. And Tawheed also means to affirm something is one. So when you say, I am doing Tawheed of Allah, essentially what you're saying is that I am affirming, I'm, I'm believing and I'm, I'm, pr I'm practicing and I'm implementing the fact that Allah is one. In Islam, Tawheed means to affirm the oneness of Allah in three different ways. Or if you like, in two different ways. It's up to you. If you want to say it means to affirm it in two different ways or three different ways, it doesn't make a lot of difference. We're going to ask you a question on that, so pay attention to this. Yeah? First of all, in Allah's actions. What do we think it means to have tawheed in Allah's actions? Someone give me an idea. I mean, it's there for you, but I want you to explain it to me. I want to see if you understand. For Allah to be one, 
in his actions to believe and to practice the fact that Allah is one in his actions what does that mean? I want to hear some different voices inshallah what do you think that means? it's not difficult, it's English words Allah is one in his actions what is that? what do we think that means? I mean, I'm going to wait until I see someone give me an answer, inshallah. Uh, does everything alone. That nobody does what Allah does except Allah. Yeah. That's basically what it means. That nobody does what Allah does except Allah. So, what are some of the things that Allah does? <coughs> Creates. Allah is the creator. What else? Sustainer. Sustainer. Allah sustains his creation. What else? Allah is the legis the one who legislates. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislates uh, the halal and the haram. Alaysallahu bi ahkamil hakimin. Isn't Allah the best of uh, al hakimin, the best of judges? What else does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Allah listens to our prayers and listens to the one in desperate need in a way that nobody else does because nobody else hears everything like Allah hears everything. What else does Allah do? Mercy. Allah sees Allah ha in a way that nobody else does. So Allah sees every single thing, even the black ant that crawls upon a black stone in the darkness of the desert, in the darkness of the night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees it and sees its limbs and sees what's inside of it and see there is no limit to the sight of Allah. What else does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? The massive one that we read all the time in the Quran. The most mercy. mercy. So Allah has mercy is merciful towards his creation so in these actions nobody does these actions except Allah you and me can be merciful you and me can see we can hear but not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy I might have mercy on you three or four times you know you know you subhanallah you do something to me and I say it doesn't matter do something to me again, I say it doesn't matter. By the third time, I'm going to lose my patience. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful upon you in every single way and it has no limit to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So nobody does the actions that Allah does except Allah. What's the second point? Our actions towards Him. What do we think this means? Tawheed in our actions towards Allah. So whatever we do towards Allah, we only do it towards Allah. We don't do it towards anyone else. Whatever worship we do, we don't do it towards anybody and anything else. So in the first part of Tawheed, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who does the stuff that He does, does the things that He does. Yep, we all okay with that? Only Allah creates, only Allah sustains, only Allah provides, only Allah has infinite mercy, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is infinitely just, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everything, only Allah hears everything. In the second part, that only Allah deserves to be worshipped, only Allah deserves to be made dua to, only Allah deserves to be things to be sacrificed to, only Allah deserves, so this second part is about what we do towards Allah. So it's Allah's actions and our actions. That Allah's actions, nobody does them but Him, and that our actions we, that we do towards Allah, we only do for Allah and to Allah. So we only pray to Allah, we only make dua to Allah, we only make sajda to Allah, we only bow to Allah, we only uh, call upon Allah for those things that you know, only He can do, and so on and so forth. And this is the most important part of Tawheed. And this is the Tawheed that the messengers were sent with. So it's very important that you pay attention to that. And the third category, the perfect names and attributes. That Allah has perfect names and attributes that are for Him alone. They are suited to His majesty. They're not similar to His creation. We take them according to their apparent meaning. We don't deny them. We don't ask anything more than the meaning that is clear to us. That's fairly self-explanatory. Now my question to you guys is, if I was to say that Tawheed is only two, which of these 
would I fit inside? What, what I'm going to have to do, I've, got, I've only got two spaces on the desk. Okay? I've only got enough space for two things. Okay? One, two. And the problem is that I have three things. So I have to put one of them inside of another. Which one of these things will I put inside of one of the others? Which one will I get rid of and put it inside of one of the others to say that Tawheed is only two? The third one into the second. The third, okay, good. Right, we've got a brother that's the first suggestion. The third one fits into the second. Do we have any other suggestions? The third one fits into the first. We still, are we thinking the third one fits into the first now? Or are you still on the second? First one, I've changed my Okay, so now we have Ijma. Now we have Ijma, alhamdulillah, in our classroom, that the third one fits into the first. You're definitely right that it's the third one that has to go. And the third one, is it a part of what Allah does, or is it a part of what we do towards Allah? Allah's names and attributes, Allah's sight, Allah's mercy, Allah. Is that a part of what Allah does or a part of what we do towards Allah? Part of what Allah does. So therefore, some of the scholars said that Tawheed is two types. Allah's actions and our actions towards Allah. And some of them said that it's three types. Allah's actions, our actions towards Allah, and Allah's perfect names and attributes. And whichever way you look at it, it's the same thing. Now we come on to La ilaha illallah, the statement of Tawheed. La ilaha illallah, the statement of Tawheed. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called the people to Islam, the only thing that he would focus on was the statement La ilaha illallah. He would say, oh my people, say La ilaha illallah and you will be successful. So. Quraysh didn't really have a big problem with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a person. Happy with that? Quraysh didn't really have a major issue with him as a person. They certainly didn't sort of have a, a major uh, sort of uh, issue or a major uh, sort of concern with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a person. Their problem was what he was teaching. What's the evidence for this? They offered him to be a leader. They offered him, you can be a king among us. With what condition? What condition did they put for him being a king? That he stopped saying, La ilaha illallah. So they had no problem with him being in charge. Like, what, you know, sometimes we see in the Quran, the people had a problem with the Prophet. For example, uh, how can he be given the kingdom over us and we are more deserving of the kingdom than him? How can Allah choose him amongst us when we are more deserving of being chosen than him? This wasn't the problem of Quraysh. Nobody in Quraysh said, I'm more deserving of being close to Allah than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But their problem was la ilaha illallah. And Allah says, Waddu law tudhinu fayudhinun. They wish that you would compromise in your belief so that they would then compromise in their belief. So they even said to him, We'll worship Allah for most of the year, and you can just worship our idols for one day, or two days, or part of the year. Or you can worship our idols for a month and you can worship our idols or, or a day and you can worship our idols for a day. And they offered him many different compromises. But he never ever compromised on this statement, La ilaha illallah. Now to put this in context, and this is where we want to use the board a little bit. The beliefs of Quraysh before the religion of Islam. The beliefs of Quraysh before the religion of Islam. Okay? So what did the Quraysh believe? So here we've got the Quraysh and we've got before Islam. What did the Quraysh believe before Islam? Okay, they believed in idols. Good. We're going to come to that in a moment. 
Who else did the or what else did the Quraysh believe in apart from the idols? They believed in Allah with a clear statement. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask them, who made the heavens and the earth, they will say, Allah. They believed in Allah. Okay. What did they believe about Allah? They believed that Allah was the Creator. What else did they believe about Allah? They believed that Allah was the sustainer. What else did they believe about Allah? The giver of life and death. Okay, so life and death. What else did they believe about Allah? What else do we have here? Controlling the universe? What else did they believe about Allah? Okay, so sending down the rain. Answering the prayer. <coughs> Answering the prayer in times of need. So here we see, they believed all of these things about Allah. What do you recognize from the categories of Tawheed that this all relates to? Attributes, true, it all relates to the actions of Allah. So it all relates to what we call Rububiyyah, the Lordship of Allah. And that is basically the actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. So that Allah is the only one who sustains, Allah is the only one who provides. So if they believe this, where's the problem? The problem is the idols. Now we have to ask first of all, what kind of idols did they believe in? Give me some examples of the, because they were not just idols. They had an origin, they, had a, they came from somewhere. Where did these idols come from? Dead people. They came from the angels. People are good at reading the book. <laughs> they came from stones. They came from where else? Trees. Trees. The stars. They came from the sun and the moon. They came from the prophets. They came from the pious people. Like this like the likes of Mary, Maryam and others. Where else? Have we got anything else? Anyone want to add anything else? Uh, maybe animals. animals possibly, certainly people, maybe, maybe, maybe perhaps not Quraysh, but people definitely, they had uh, people and religions in the past have had, so we can probably put that with a little dot, a dotted line and we can say possibly animals. I think Quraysh not so, but I think other religions yes. So the question is, they believe in all of these idols. What is the point of them believing in these idols when they believe that Allah answers your dua, sends down the rain, is the sustainer, life and death, creator, controller of the universe? What is the purpose of the idols then? The idols have two purposes. Okay, one of them is that the idols are One of them is that they believed that the idols were intercessors. That the idols were intercessors along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's an intercessor? A middleman, right? An intercessor is the middleman, the one that you sort of uh, put in between you and, you know, you, you for example, I give an example. Uh, give me an, an example, an example of intercession that we are familiar with in the dunya. 
you want to get married okay and so you want to approach your parents that you want to get married but you feel a bit shy to talk to your parents about it and so you say to your big brother or your big sister go and talk to mom and dad and convince them that I want to get married so in other words you ask her or him to intercede on your behalf or go to so and so and convince him to give me this you know convince him to help me with this this is kind of the job of an intercessor so they believe the idols were intercessors middlemen between them and Allah what else did they use the idols for to get close to, to, get close to Allah so we can say nearness to Allah so they would say that we we worship these idols to make us near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I want to keep that on the board for a reason because I think we're going to we're going to probably use it later on okay so to attain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah azza wa jal says unquestionably for Allah is the pure religion and those who take protectors besides him say we only worship them to make us nearer to Allah indeed Allah will judge between them concerning that over which they differ Allah does not guide the one who is a liar and a disbeliever. Um, before you move on, could you just go over that word, uh, Rububiyya? Rububiyya. is a word that means in English, Lordship, about being a Rabb. And what is a Rabb? At the end of the day, the Rabb is the one who provides, sustains, creates. All of these things are to do with Allah being the Rabb. The, you know, sends down the rain. All the actions of Allah, they are the actions of the Rabb. And that's why we call it Rububiyya. It's a word that comes from Rabb. As in Allah, the, the, the attributes of Allah that, are, that make Him the Lord. You know, that, that He creates, sustains and provides. So they did it to gain nearness to Allah. And they did not believe that these idols could harm them and benefit them directly. But they believed that these idols would take their dua and send it to Allah. Bear in mind, these idols were dead people. Some of these idols were prophets. Some of these idols were representations of angels. Some of these idols were trees. Some of these idols were stones. Some of these idols were, and so on and so forth. All of the things that we wrote down on the board. So all of these things were kinds of idols that they would worship. So they would go to the prophets and say, make me near to Allah. And they would go to the angels and say, make me near to Allah. They would go to the, uh, to the, street, the trees and the stones and the stars and the sun and the moon and say, make me near to Allah. They would ask those things to take their dua and give it up towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now some of you might be sitting there and thinking that reminds you of a lot of Muslims and this is the problem. This is the problem. The problem is that now as an Ummah, we have returned to the days of Jahiliyyah. We've returned, many of us, to doing the same things that Quraysh used to do. Going to the Prophets and asking them to make them near to Allah. Going to the saints and the pious people and asking them to make them near to Allah. So keep that in mind because we're going to talk about that inshaAllah later. Let's break down this phrase La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah Let's break it down La means no Or it means there is no Ilaha We're going to talk about in a moment Illa means accept And Allah means Allah So there is no Ilah Except Allah There is no Ilah Except Allah. Okay? There is no ilah except Allah. Good. What now we have to ask ourselves, what does the word ilah mean? So if there is no ilah except Allah, what does the word ilah mean? There are two theories or two opinions about the word ilah. One of them is true and one of them isn't. Okay? One of them is true and one of them isn't. The first theory says that Ilah is a creator, sustainer and provider. 
So la ilaha illallah means there is no creator except Allah, no sustainer except Allah, no provider except Allah, no one who sends down the rain except Allah, no one who answers the dua except Allah. What's the problem with this? The problem with this is what we've described is exactly what we've just written on the board. And in case you haven't noticed, the guys we're talking about that we wrote on the board are not Muslim. Not only are they not Muslim, but they are actually the Ummah that the Prophet ﷺ is fighting sword to sword. And Allah calls them kathibun kafar. Uh, you know, the person who is a liar and a disbeliever for their, you know, saying about their intercession. And their, their coming nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is really quite important. If we say that la ilaha illallah means there's no creator except Allah, there's no sustainer except Allah, there's no provider except Allah, there's no one who answers your dua except Allah, many, many Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, idol worshippers would suddenly become Muslim. Because currently what we've just described in this theory is exactly what Quraysh used to believe. Does everybody understand that? Yeah? Everyone completely understand that. So why there's a problem with this is because it's exactly what Quraysh used to believe and the Prophet ﷺ was sent to them and Allah says about them, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Say, oh disbelievers. <coughs> How are they disbelievers? If they said, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ and لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ means there is no creator or sustainer or provider. Why do they have such a problem with لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ if it means this, why are they saying to the Prophet Sallallahu leave your religion for a day and we'll worship, uh, your, we'll worship Allah for the rest of the year? What, it, what, what, what is so uh, difficult for them to understand or so difficult for them to appreciate? Where's the problem? The problem is that they didn't understand this by La ilaha illallah. What they understood was the second theory which is that ilah is something which is worshipped. So la ilaha illallah means there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. And this is where they started to differ. Because they used to worship other than Allah. And now we see the consistency. The fact that Quraysh used to worship the idols. So they used to worship other than Allah. They believed Allah was the creator, but they used to worship other than, other than Him. So when the Prophet ﷺ said to them, La ilaha illallah, what did they understand? They understand that La ilaha illallah means no more idols. That's what they understood. They understood very, very clearly that La ilaha illallah means no more idols. And this is why they had such a problem. Ilah is used clearly in the Quran uh, for something that is worshipped. Uh, the last, I want to bring your attention to the last ayah in the, in the, on the page. Ask those we sent before you of our messengers, have we made besides the most merciful alihatan yu'badun? Yu'b uh, yu or have we made beside the Prophet beside the uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any gods or any ilah that is worshipped? Notice how Allah says the word ilah and then says worshipped. And that is the meaning of ilah. Ilah is something that is worshipped. When Quraysh said, has he made all of our gods into one god? They were clearly not meaning, has he made all of our creators into one creator? Has he made all of our gods that send down the rain into one god? No, they, they already had this uh, belief, but their issue was that it, it meant that they had to leave worshipping other than Allah Azza wa Jal. La ilaha illallah, as a statement, is made up of two parts. It's made up of La ilaha and it's made up of illallah. La ilaha means to disbelieve in anything that is worshipped besides Allah. To disbelieve in anything 
that is worship besides Allah. And illallah means to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We need both of these things. What happens if we say la ilah, full stop? We become atheist, we don't believe in any God. We say, I don't believe in any God at all. I don't worship any God. That's exactly what the atheists say. La ilaha, there isn't any God to worship. If we just say that we worship Allah, that doesn't necessarily mean, by saying that we worship Allah, that doesn't mean, just by saying I worship Allah, doesn't mean that I've stopped worshiping the idols. Yeah? Do we all understand that? Just because I say that I worship Allah, doesn't mean that I've stopped worshipping the idols. So for La ilaha illallah to work, we need both bits. We need the part of La ilaha illallah that relates to disbelieving in everything that is worshipped besides Allah. The idols, the stones, the trees, the stars, the sun, the moon, the prophets, the angels, the awliya, the saints, whatever it is. And then we need the bit which says that we worship Allah alone. So we declare ourselves free from atheism and free from polytheism. What's atheism? Atheism, I, I think it's interesting that people sometimes describe atheism as a belief. Atheism is really a lack of belief. But atheism is a belief that there is no God or a lack of a belief in any God. And what's polytheism? Belief in many gods. So la ilaha illallah says that we are right in the middle. We are neither atheist nor are we polytheist. We don't worship more than Allah nor do we worship less than Allah. We only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Further notes on the meaning of la ilaha illallah. We said that there is no, la ilaha illallah means there is no God except Allah. The problem is that if we say there is no God except Allah, this is wrong in a factual sense because there are lots of gods besides Allah. Lots and lots of gods besides Allah. There is, you know, uh, you can name loads. That, you know, I had a Raz and, Raz and Anubis I had in an email recently. You know, like there is the, you know, there is like uh, Thor and, and there are, you know, the, the sort of Vishnu and Shiva and there are lots and lots and lots of gods that are worshipped besides Allah. So what should this, what do we understand by La ilaha illallah? We understand there is no true God except Allah because all of these gods, Vishnu and Shiva and all of these different gods that they mention and Raz and uh, Anubis and all of these things, they are all false gods. They don't deserve to be worshipped. They are gods because they are taken as gods besides Allah. People take them as gods besides Allah. But they are not true gods. They are not real gods. They are not, it's not correct to believe that they are gods. They are false gods, false objects of worship. So there is no God worthy of worship except Allah or there is no true God except Allah. That's how we need to understand the sentence. La ilaha illallah, ya ikhwani, has conditions. The conditions of la ilaha illallah are al-ilmu wal-yaqeenu wal-qabulu wal-inqiyadu fadri ma aqulu wal-sidqu wal-ikhlasu wal-mahabba wal-thaqaq allahu li ma ahabba. There are the conditions of la ilaha illallah uh, as in the poem of al-Hafid uh, al al-Hakami, rahimahullah. But I've summarized them for you in English. First of all, knowledge. Many, many people say la ilaha illallah, but they don't know what it means. Example, let's just say I stop a builder in the street, okay? And I say to him, may I want you to say something for me. Say la ilaha illallah. And he says la ilaha illallah. Did he become Muslim? No, because he doesn't know what it means. He just said it. Someone who hears it in a nasheed and just says it. Someone who... You know, Iyadhan Billah, you know, they use these things in music or something like that and they hear it and they say it. It doesn't make you a Muslim. What makes you a Muslim is you have to understand what it actually means. Likewise, the fact that some of the Muslims say La ilaha illallah doesn't necessarily mean that they have truly entered themselves into Islam. They have to have knowledge of what it means. 
Secondly, they have to be certain. There's no point in me saying, well, you know, I say la ilaha illallah because, and I've met some agnostic people like this. They say, we believe in God because let's just hedge our bets, basically. If we believe in God and he's true, then we're going to go to paradise. And we, if we believe in God and he's not true, we're not going to lose anything out. So we're just basically betting against it. So I'm not really certain that there is no God but Allah, but you know, it's better to say it than not. And then I, you know, I just, no, you have to be certain in what you say. You have to have yaqeen. You have to believe that when you say la ilaha illallah, you're sure about it. You have to have acceptance. You have to accept what la ilaha illallah entails. It's no good saying la ilaha illallah. I know what it means. I believe it with certainty. And then I go and worship Jesus. That's not going to work because I haven't accepted what la ilaha illallah actually means. That it means that I have to abandon everything that is worship besides Allah and that it means that I have to worship Allah alone. Submission. You have to submit to Allah and His laws. You can't say, yeah, la ilaha illallah, totally agree with that. I know what it means and I believe in it with certainty. And I, you know, I accept that I have to stop worshipping the idols, but I'm not going to follow Islam. I'm not going to follow any of the laws of Islam. I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing. I'm not going to, you know, sort of implement anything in Islam. I just believe in la ilaha illallah. Don't believe in Islam. That doesn't work either. You have to submit to Allah and you have to submit to the laws of Allah in Islam. Truthfulness. You have to be truthful when you say it. What group of people weren't truthful when they said La ilaha illallah? The munafiqeen, the hypocrites. They used to say La ilaha illallah, aminu wajha nahar, wakfuru akhirahu. Like they used to say, like Allah said in the Quran, they used to say, believe in the religion of Islam, you know, in the, during the daytime. And then at the end of the day, disbelieve in the hope, la'allahum yarji'un, in the hope that they will return back from their religion. So the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they used to say la ilaha illallah, but they weren't saying it truthfully. They were lying when they said it. Sincerity. How many people say la ilaha illallah because mom and dad want them to say la ilaha illallah? Because if they don't, it will be shameful on the community because and all of the other things. That's not good enough. La ilaha illallah, you have to be sincere that the reason you're saying la ilaha illallah is not because you want to get married. Lot, that's a big problem with sincerity in La ilaha illallah. A lot of people enter into Islam and they say La ilaha illallah because they know it's the only way they can marry that girl. And that, again, we accept it from them because we accept La ilaha illallah from even the Prophet accepted La ilaha illallah from the munafiqeen. But we believe that if you die and you don't really have that sincerity, it's not going to be accepted from you. So don't get me wrong, if someone comes and says, you know, I, I found this girl and she's Muslim, I want to marry her and I'm going to become Muslim. And you can see clearly that person doesn't have, you know, it, it's got nothing to do with Islam. You accept it from them, like the Prophet ﷺ accepted it from the Munafiqeen. But you believe that, you know, inshallah, we need to develop their Islam until it comes a time when they are sincere for Allah alone. Likewise, a child, you encourage a child to say, La ilaha illallah, even though they don't understand why or they don't understand the reasons behind it. Little two year old says, La ilaha illallah, they don't understand the reasons behind it. But that's okay. But as they get older, they develop that sincerity. The point is, before you die, you need to have that sincerity in La ilaha illallah. And finally, the love of Allah. And the love of Allah is the head of the bird that guides you. Uh, and that you only love Allah uh, with the love that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves. There's another point we have to deal with. And I know we are not doing great in keeping to the time limits at the moment. But there's another thing that we have to deal with. Worship. What is worship? Because if you, let's just say, that you see somebody who is prostrating to an idol or somebody who's making dua to a grave and you say to that person Ya Akhi, what are you doing? You know, you know that and you explain to them La ilaha illallah and you explain to them about the, the, the intercessors and you explain to them about seeking nearness to Allah through other people and you, you know, you go through the whole thing they say to you what I'm doing is not worship so what we need to talk about is what is worship? How do we define worship? 
how do we explain worship? Worship is a comprehensive term for everything that Allah loves and is pleased with, statements and actions, whether hidden or apparent. Some examples of worship, dua, and there's an ayah for it, love, and again the ayah is there in the book for you, fear, and again the ayah is there for a book, prayer and sacrifice, and again the ayah is there for you in the book. What is the opposite of Tawheed? There's no disagreement in Islam that the opposite of Tawheed is Shirk. And the opposite of Tawheed is to give one or more of the rights of Allah to someone or something else. To give one or more of the rights of Allah to someone or something else. For everything we talked about in Tawheed, in Dua, prayer, sacrifice, whatever it is, there is an equal and opposite category of Shirk. Shirk will not be forgiven if a person does not repent from it in this life. Indeed, Allah does not forgive that you make a partner with Him, but He forgives whatever else for whoever He wills. Shirk causes a person to reside in the hellfire forever. I think it's also important for you to note that there is a difference between Shirk and Kufr, even though that difference is very slight. And that is that kufr is a bit wider. Disbelief is a wider topic than shirk. You can disbelieve in Allah without committing shirk. Even though shirk is the majority of the form of disbelief uh, with regard to Allah, you can disbelieve in Allah without committing shirk in some very limited circumstances. So we have to understand that shirk is... In, is the, so if you have here, we have a big circle and a little circle inside. The little circle inside is shirk and the big circle outside is kufr. So everything that is major shirk is kufr, but not everything that is kufr is necessarily shirk. Um, and that's because you can have issues of kufr that don't relate to giving the rights of Allah to someone or something else. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Okay, very briefly at the end, and this isn't too much of a long uh, uh, topic, we have a few minutes, five minutes or so, is the second part. So what we've done now is just basically explain to you in about half an hour what it means to say La ilaha illallah. Is everyone quite confident that they understand now the concept behind La ilaha illallah? Now we come on to Muhammad Rasulullah, and just like we had a name for La ilaha illallah Tawheed, we have a name for Muhammad Rasulullah and we call it Ittiba'. Ittiba'. And Ittiba' means to follow. And it's not usually used for a literal sense, as in, I follow the brother to the masjid. It's used in a sense of following a religion, or following someone as an example, or following your desires, or following your dreams, you know, that kind of following. Ittiba'. Muhammadur Rasulullah is the statement of ittiba' like La ilaha illallah is the statement of Tawheed. So just like La ilaha illallah is a statement which represents Tawheed, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a statement of ittiba'. In English it's very simple. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. But in Arabic it means three things. There are three main things that are meant by Muhammadur Rasulullah. When you say Muhammadur Rasulullah, effectively you're talking about three things. The first thing is that you believe in what he told you about. Can you imagine someone saying Muhammadur Rasulullah and saying, I don't believe in the jinn? Muhammadur Rasulullah, I don't believe in the last day. Muhammadur Rasulullah, I don't believe in the punishment of the grave. Muhammad Rasulullah, I don't believe in the Isra and the Mi'raj. I don't believe that the Prophet went up to the heavens. This is unacceptable because you're saying that he's the messenger of Allah, but you're not believing the things that he told you about. So especially things that relate to his prophethood, and things that relate to the unseen, like what he told you about Allah, what he told you about the angels, the jinn, the day of judgment, paradise, hellfire, and the prophecies of what is going to come. You have to believe in them 
for you to say Muhammad Rasulullah. The second part of Muhammad Rasulullah is that you obey him in what he commanded you to do. So if we look at the, what the Prophet Sallallahu commanded us to do, there are four type of things that the Prophet Sallallahu commanded us to do. There are obligations, wajibat, you have to do them. Give me an example of an obligation in Islam. Salah, salah. you have to pray, fard salah, you have to pray it. Okay? The salah al faridah the fard salah, you have to pray, the obligatory salah. Give me an example of something the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recommended. The night prayer. Fasting on a Monday and Thursday, the siwak. Yeah, the miswak or the siwak. So these are examples of things that he recommended. Give me an example of something that he forbade us from. Alcohol. Brilliant. Give me an example of something that he disliked for us to do. Good, excellent, very, very good. Onions before eating raw onions before going to the masjid. And that's based upon the ulama who say that this is, uh, uh, that this is kirahiyah and not uh, tahrim. That when he said, whoever eats from this tree, let him not attend our jama'ah. Uh, again, the, 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 I would say probably the majority of the scholars say this, this statement, do not attend, is kirahiyah. It's disliked for you to attend when you've eaten raw onions. Okay. Are all of these the same? Are all of these four categories the same in terms of your reward and your punishment or not? They're all different. What is the reward and the punishment in the wajibat, in the obligatory actions? Okay, what, what is the reward for and what's the punishment for? Okay, so the punishment is when you don't do them, you don't pray, you don't fast, you don't give zakah, and the reward is for when you do them. Okay, when you pray, when you fast, when you give the zakah. What about the recommendations? What's the punishment and the reward in those? There's reward if you do it, but there's no punishment if you don't do it. If you don't use the siwak before every prayer, there's no punishment, but there's a reward if you do it. What about those things that are disliked? Swap it around. There is no punishment if you do them, but there is a reward if you don't. What about the things that are haram? There's a punishment if you do them, and there's a reward if you don't. Yeah, so we clear that these are different types of advice. Why did we say that recommendations are included in Muhammad or Rasulullah? Because this is going to make you more complete in your love for the Prophet. We're not saying that if you don't do the recommended acts, you haven't given the proper meaning of Muhammad or Rasulullah. You have given the proper meaning. But it's not as complete as the person who does all of the recommended actions as well. That person is more complete in their belief of Muhammad Rasulullah. And the third is that we only worship Allah in the way that He taught us and that He showed us. And this brings us on to the second topic, which is the look, what is the opposite of Tawheed? We said is shirk. And the opposite of ittiba' is bid'ah. The opposite of ittiba' is bid'ah. So just like shirk is the opposite of Tawheed, the opposite of ittiba' is bid'ah. And bid'ah is the worst of the major sins after shirk. The root of the word bid'ah in Arabic means to initiate something or to invent something without anyone having done it before. So bid'ah in your business, in your company, in your, you know, your bringing out of a new product is a, is a wonderful thing. You know, like people say, oh, it's ibda'. You know, he's got ibda'. They bring out new products like the iPhone, you know, like this is a, a, a bid'ah, you know, in the linguistic sense of the word, yeah? It's not a bid'ah in the deen. Because nothing to do with the religion. It's a bid'ah in the linguistic sense of the word. It's something that they invented that didn't have any previous example apart from the one that they copied from Samsung. But that's a different story, yeah? It didn't have any previous example. So bid'ah is to do something 
to initiate, to invent something that didn't have any previous example. In Islam, bid'ah is to introduce something into the religion of Allah that has no general or specific proof for it. There is a clear principle regarding bid'ah. Everything in the religion is haram. Except what? Everything in the religion is haram except those things that Allah made halal. Everything in the dunya is halal except what? Those things that Allah made haram. So sometimes I remember there's a brother in, the, in a local masjid and he said to me, brother, if you think that my, I don't know, tasbih or my dhikr or whatever is bid'ah, then I think you driving a car is bid'ah. What's wrong with this statement? If someone says, I think, if you think me with doing my tasbih with one of those rosary beads the Catholics have is a bid'ah, then I think that you driving a car is a bid'ah. He's doing a bid'ah in the religion. I'm doing a bid'ah in the dunya. And as for the bid'ah in the dunya, there is nothing wrong with new things in the dunya. You, you know, your mobile phones and your cars and your whatever. The problem is the bid'ah in the deen. And we don't usually call things in the dunya bid'ah, we call it usually ibda' instead of bid'ah. But in any case, the point is linguistically, uh, you know, when they say bid'atun hasana and stuff like that, and, and uh, you know, they, they're talking usually about ibda' in the, in the dunya, you know, like bringing something good in the dunya. But as for the deen, you're not allowed to add anything to it. Bid'ah is so serious because First of all, a person will never, ever, ever repent. Why won't you repent from bid'ah? You think you're doing the most pious, holy thing that you can do. The ayah here, I want you to finish the ayah. The ayah here. Uh, in Surah Al-Kahf. قُلْ هَلْ أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ أَعْمَالًا أَلَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ سُنْعًا So there's a, just put a dot, dot, dot after the ayah and fill in the next ayah after, after it, yeah? So just here where it says 18103, just put a dot 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 and make sure you go home and you fill in, you, you copy down the, the, the next part. It is those who waste their efforts in this dunya when they think they are doing the best in their deeds. And Ibn Abbas amongst others, uh, Wallahu tabarak wa ta'alam, uh, considered these to be the people of bid'ah, the people who they think they are doing the best of their deeds. They think that they're hajj and they fast and they pray and nothing is accepted by Allah because it's not in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bid'ah is so serious because it involves either saying that your way is better than the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because you're saying that basically I do dhikr the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa never did. So you say no problem, is your dhikr better or is his dhikr better? Now if they say my dhikr is better, they've disbelieved, right? Clear? Someone says my way is better than the way of the Prophet Sallallahu he's kafir, he's disbelieved, he's left Islam. If he says that I believe that my prayer is better than his prayer, or that my dua is better than his dua, so then it comes onto another issue. He says, no, no, no brother, I don't think it's better. You say, do you believe the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam failed to teach us what we needed in our deen? Do you believe that he failed to teach us everything we needed? No. So how can you do something new in the religion and you say that it's not better than the Prophet ﷺ and you say that he fulfilled his job and he taught us everything we need to know, so why didn't he teach us this? And you imply that the religion is not good enough for our time. You imply that we need to add a few things on because the religion just isn't keeping up. We need to, you know, we need to complete the religion, it's not, it's not completely there for you. Bid'ah involves losing a sunnah. Every time you do a bid'ah, you lose a sunnah. Because the bid'ah that you do erases the sunnah that is in place of it. So, you know, you're doing bid'ah with your little Catholic rosary beads instead of doing tasbih with your fingers. So, by doing this bid'ah, you lose a sunnah, you kill a sunnah off and people, so that now when you do dhikr on your fingers, people look at you and say, what are you doing, ya get into the, you know, 21st century, yeah, get yourself an electric tasbih, subhanallah, like why are you counting things, sunnah is lost, yeah, 
the sunnah is lost and it causes misguidance amongst the people and it causes misguidance to spread amongst the people that is more than enough we, we, for our second session inshallah now uh, time wise we're taking a break inshallah ta'ala uh, for uh, salat of dhuhr inshallah ta'ala and then inshallah we're going to talk about Allah's perfect names and attributes and ideally what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to skip over some material and ask you to read it at home and I'm also going to try and leave some time for questions and answers because we are really, I said today would be intensive because there's a lot to cover and a short amount of time. So inshallah, as long as we stay broadly within the, the time limits, inshallah, we, we'll do our best. So we're going to break now for Salat al-Dhuhr, bi-idhni ta'ala.